there are plenty of fragmentary specimens out there. Some are waiting to be found, others have been found long ago. Most will never be able to provide more than a footnote at worst, or a data point at best. It is due to the very nature of the biologic, paleontologic, and geologic records. One such find, singular in nature, provides but a peek into a world of giant pterosaurs that we may never get a full glimpse of. There's a lot of things we now know about the distant past that seemed impossible only a few decades ago. Discovering the colors of fossilized animals, fragments of collagen and dinosaur bones, and even finding near-complete remains of previously enigmatic animals like Dinochylus and Spinosaurus. But there's still a lot of things we don't know, and never will. The fossil record is a spotty and broken mess, very incomplete. Even as we answer some questions, others remain frustratingly unanswered, and even more questions are raised. Evolution, missing links, behavior, coloration, all will be explored on Paleo Mysteries. During the late Cretaceous, pterosaurs were a common element of terrestrial ecosystems and were thought to have filled a range of ecological niches. However, studies of this group have been constrained by the relative rarity of skeletal material, which is partly due to strong geological biases. Therefore, even isolated and incomplete bones can offer crucial details for determining the geographic range and overall physical traits of pterosaurs. The Kuiperowitz Formation preserves rocks deposited along the eastern margin of Laramidia during the late Campanian Epoch of the Late Cretaceous, approximately 76.6 to 74.5 million years ago. With significant exposures within Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument in southern Utah. River channels, floodplains, and associated environments are all preserved in the formation, which depicts a continental depositional environment. Numerous tetrapods, such as birds, non-avian dinosaurs, crocodilomorphs, turtles, mammals, amphibians, and lepidosaurs have a rich fossil record with beautifully preserved examples. There are only a few known examples of pterosaurs though, the first known pterosaur fossil from the Kuiperowitz Formation was a solitary finger bone, which pointed to a small individual of a very rough 3 meter wingspan. Later reports included the incomplete but associated skeleton of an ashtarchid and a potential pteranodontoid hand bone, both of which are still awaiting official descriptions. Back in 2020, paleontologist Andrew Fark published a paper on RAM-22574, an isolated probable ulna bone from technically the largest pterosaur yet known from the Kuiperowitz Formation, at a very roughly estimated 4.3 to 5.9 meter wingspan. Despite being just one bone, it demonstrates the size range the group was capable of attaining in late Cretaceous southern Utah and broadens the knowledge of the distribution of large pterosaurs in terrestrial environments during the late Campanian of western North America. This singular pterosaur fragment was found at the RAM V2-005022 locality, also referred to as the Kripe site. In the middle section of the Kuiperowitz formation, multiple associated elements from a Tyrannosaurid, at least two Hadrosaurids, turtles, and a small Ashtarchid pterosaur can be found at this location, which is a multi-taxon bone bed. At the Kripe site, the bone bed is over one meter thick and is thought to have undergone at least three major depositional events, with some small bone reworking visible at the top of the sequence. Depositional events here mainly referring to three huge events of new sediments coming into the area and covering things. Reworking refers to bones that become deposited in sediments and then erode out later and then get buried again. Various states of fossilization can occur to these bones as they are reworked, and it can obscure exactly how old they are. 
Thankfully, there are clues that tell you whether or not a bone has been reworked. The pterosaur Ola was found in a sandy mudstone with numerous clay rip-up clasts, plant detritus, at the stratigraphic top of the quarry, about 1.2 meters above the lowest fossil. Damage inflicted to the bone before it came to rest and be covered by sediments is visible in the parts of the bone that connected with and moved against other bones. The articular surfaces. This damage may be the result of pumping, slamming, or grinding up against objects due to the action of flowing water by the water itself or simply due to decay. The fossil was discovered partly in the same bedding plane and within one meter of an associated Ashtarket skeleton, which was given the label of RAM 15445. However, the singular ulna, RAM 22574, is from a much larger individual as evidenced by its length, which is 36 centimeters, as opposed to its radius, which should be roughly the same as the ulna length Yet that bone is around 20 centimeters for the RAM 15445 specimen. The wingspan of RAM 22574 was acquired by scaling from the relatively complete wings of other pterodactyloid pterosaurs. Here, wing length is calculated as the sum of all sequential forelimb long bone lengths, humerus, ulna, metacarpal 4, phalanges in digit 4, excluding the carpals. Wingspan is approximated by doubling wing length. As Dave Hone and Michael Benton noted in 2007, this neglects the width of the torso, but that is offset in part by the flexion of the wings in life. Data were taken from measurements published by the 2000 work of David Unwin, J. Liu, and N. N. Beccarina, as well as Michael Bennett's 2001 work on Pteranodon. Assuming that RAM 22574 was an ulna, each wing was scaled by ulna size for that specimen. To reduce concerns about things scaling up correctly, only specimens in the approximate size range of RAM 22574 were used. Because RAM 22574 was slightly telescoped, two calculations were run, one with the bone length as preserved and another adding an additional 15 millimeters to the bone length to accommodate the effects of the crushing. Okay, but what is the bone? I said, if it is an ulna, why? Dr. Fark confidently identified this fossil as a pterosaur limb bone, but tentatively as an ulna. Because the descriptive terminology hinges upon these assumptions, he found it prudent to first address the underlying logic. RAM 22574 is clearly hollow, which for the late Cretaceous restricts possible identifications to either theropods or pterosaurs. The extremely thin cortical bone, between 0.7 and 1.7 millimeters, relative to the size of the element, is distinct to pterosaurs versus their outgroup clades, particularly for elements of this size. Thus, the identification to pterosaurs is quite confident. This is a flappy beast bone without a shadow of a doubt. Because key parts of RAM 22574 were damaged prior to fossilization, identification of this bone within the skeleton is less certain. It's clearly a limb bone of some kind, rather than vertebra, ribs, or skull bits, but doesn't match well with shapes expected for any of the hind limb elements. There is nothing that resembles either the head or far end of the femur, nor the relatively slender profile of a typical pterosaur femur. The overall robustness of the bone differs sharply from what is usually seen in the tibia and fibula of late Cretaceous pterosaurs of this size. A humerus can be excluded on the basis of a lack of a deltopectoral crest, which is a flange of bone sticking out of the top of this bone, or the bulbous distal articular surface processes, which are the places where the bone articulates with the rest of the bones. Neither articular end shapes nor element proportions fall within what would be expected for metacarpals or phalanges, hand and finger bones, regardless of clade. Thus, a radius or ulna seems to be the most likely identification. The more heavily damaged end of RAM 22574 shows topographic complexity that differs from what is seen in typical pterosaur radii. 
the surface textures are wonky. A prominent protrusion, this one labeled VC, resembles a similar expansion associated with bones of Montanaj Darko and also an ulna referred to Cryotacon. The relatively restricted nature of this protrusion differs from the more elongate, tab-like anterior tuberosity seen on a radius referred to Ash Darko, the OG Big Lizard Bird. The overall proportions of RAM 22574 are more similar to that of an ulna than a radius. For instance, Quetzalcoatlus shows that radii tend to be far more proportionally slenderer than ulnae. Similar proportions are seen in Montanaj Darko, Ash Darko, Maradactylus, and also in Pteranodon as a few examples. Unfortunately, REM22574's fragmented and broken nature restricts how the element and animal can be understood. The element cannot yet be identified outside of Pterosauria since neither the radius nor the ulna exhibit strong diagnostic traits in pterosaurs. RAM22574, however, is just the second formally described element and the largest pterosaur bone known from the Kuiperowitz formation. As such, it is useful for describing the size of some pterosaurs in the Kuiperowitz habitat. The total wingspan for RAM22574 is estimated at 4.3 to 5.9 meters. This places it within the same size range as specimens of Quetzalcoatlus or Cryodracon. Montana Darko has an estimated 2.5 meter wingspan and Navajo Dactylus 3.5 meters. That makes this REM22574 one of the larger pterosaurs known from the late Campanian age rock layers of North America, alongside some specimens of Cryodracon, of course. All of this demonstrates that pterosaurs of this size were across North America at this time, in both the North and the South. RAM22574 is smaller than the largest known cryodracon individuals, but since pterosaurs of this size were around at this time and place, it opens the possibility for even larger ones to have been around earlier than thought. Like Quetzalcoatlus and Hatsagopteryx sized pterosaurs, Future discoveries will undoubtedly help clarify evolutionary relationships between pterosaurs living in terrestrial environments at this time to see if they were relatively geographically restricted or if individual species had continent-level ranges. Additionally, more work is required to determine if large pterosaurs played similar ecological roles across their various environments. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to Elephant Tier patrons Abby Smith, Arda Bayer, Biotiverse, Cherry Shaw, Chris Frampton, Christoph Hubbinger, Dinosaur, Ed Peretz, Isaiah Garza, Jax the Hacks, Natty Cat, PA Brew News, Ray, Rudy Redgrave, Smiling Walrus, Staniforth Hopkins, Steve Bradshaw, Thea Svensson, and Extraterrestrial as well as my top as tier Tyrannosaurus patrons, Admin, Antron, Aphid Kirby, Cyber, Dana Manchester, Danny Van Heck, Henry Brennan, Iberospinus, Iron Bladesman, Joshua Mana, Panic, Radio 404, Robert Kessler, Ruben Zachariah, Swaffles is Weird, Teeny Dragator, and The Dogman.